A warm welcome to everyone to a China Institute virtual discussion of a wonderful new book, An Ecological History of Modern China by Professor Stephen Harrell. My name is Jia Wang. I'm the Deputy Director of the China Institute at the University of Alberta. I'm so honored that Professor Harrell will be with us for the next 90 minutes, sharing insights from his substantial recent publication, 20 Years in the Making, that was published just this summer. This monograph addresses important and intriguing questions, such as, is environmental degradation an inevitable result of economic development? Can ecosystems be restored once government and the public are committed to doing so? Is it possible to achieve prosperity at, and sustainability at the same time? More information and also a discount code on this must-read book can be found in the uh, Q&A um, button section below your screen. The University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Professor Harrell's presentation will be followed by moderated discussion between him and our three distinguished discussants. And then there will be opportunities for all our audio members to ask your questions. Now, it's my distinct honor to introduce our featured author, Professor Stephen Harrell, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology and Environmental and Forest Sciences at the University of Washington where he taught from 1974 to 2017. A preeminent anthropologist on China, Professor Horel's research and field work spanned over four decades in mainland China and Taiwan and written and edited over 15 books. Now also let me briefly introduce our esteemed colleagues who will join us as discussants they are Professor Ashley Isaray, Professor Loretta Lowe, and Director Philippe Rowe. Dr. Isaray is Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at University of Alberta. His research focuses on media and politics in the PRC and Taiwan, environmentalism, peace and security in East Asia, and leadership politics. He has written and also edited multiple volumes more recently on Xi Jinping's leadership on Chinese politics and foreign relations, eco-developmentalism in East Asia, and also Taiwan's democracy. Dr. Loretta Lowe is assistant professor of anthropology and degree director for the master's program in global and planetary health at Durham University. Her research focuses on sustainable living in Hong Kong and perceptions of pollution and well-being in southern China. She's the co-editor-in-chief of Worldwide Waste, Journal of Interdisciplinary Studies. Last and definitely not the least, our third discussant, uh, Mr. Philippe Rowe. Philippe joined the China Institute as the new director this September, following a 25 year career in the Canadian Foreign Service with a primary focus on China and East Asia. He has been posted to the region six times and also served as the Consul General in Chongqing and Guangzhou until this summer. We were very fortunate to have someone with his level of experience and knowledge of China, but also bilateral relations between Canada and China at the University of Alberta. Now, without further ado, Stephen, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jia. And I want to express my great appreciation to the China, China Center at the University of Alberta, and of course, to all the three uh, commentators who are probably, I'm certain, going to have some really interesting things to say uh, about this book. Now, I try this screen share magic and we see if we have the slide. Do we have the slide? 
We do. Anyone? Is it good? Yes. All right. Thank you. Sorry for the slight delay. I, I want to talk briefly about how this book came about and what is the um, some of the questions that I um, that are raised by writing it. I've, but first, I want to say a word for this uh, unjustly imprisoned uh, great scholar of Xinjiang society and culture, uh, Professor Rahile Dawood, who was sentenced uh, unjustly to life in prison for, as far as anyone can tell, uh, being a faithful recorder of uh, Uyghur culture lest we forget what kind of regime we're dealing with when we talk about uh, uh, China uh, in, in any way. Now, on to the book. Um, in 2007, a conference invitation came from Joseph Eshrick and Zhang Yingjin from the University of California at San Diego, uh, new perspectives on shifting grounds in, in contemporary China and Chinese studies and there would be a conference volume, so I wrote a paper. And the paper was really to talk about how we might see recent Chinese history, that's to say since the founding of the People's Republic, not so much in the sense in the um, through the lens of political economy where, you know, this leader superseded that leader at this meeting and it led to such and such a policy but to look at the periodization from the standpoint of the environment of the physical China. And uh, in order to do that, you could see that you would periodize modern Chinese history really rather differently. Uh, you wouldn't talk so much about who, you know, where the leftists were in charge and where the rightists were in charge, when was the cultural revolution, uh, but you would talk about how policies and the physical environment influenced each other. And you come out with a really rather different periodization um, where the Great Leap Forward takes much more, more prominence than the Cultural Revolution uh, because it collapsed the entire ecosystem of China uh, for about three years and, of course, caused the worst to famine in terms of human suffering in all of world history anywhere. Um, and then after that, uh, the China pursued um, uh, developmentalism, as we call it, uh, in a very environmentally unconscious way. And it didn't really change when the Cultural Revolution gave way to the Gaiga Kaifang, the so-called reform and opening. And it wasn't until the late 20th century, right at the end of the 20th century, and I suggest spurred on by the enormous disasters of floods uh, in central China, but also in uh, Guangdong and also in the Heilongjiang, uh, when the state began to pay attention uh, in a serious way, not just a lip service way, uh, to the fact that development is not going to continue uh, unless it's environmentally conscious. And uh, Professor Esri and I have been co-editors of a book about the uh, eco-developmental state. So that was the kind of the starting point. And then uh, UCSD uh, people who started that conference decided, well, yeah, maybe not. We won't have a, um, a conference volume after all. And so I started thinking, how should I shorten this? Because it was a long and rather tedious paper that I wrote. How should I shorten it uh, to be publishable in a journal? And one of the people I asked was the uh, redoubtable and incredibly uh, erudite U Eugene Anderson. I hope many of you know him. If you're on Facebook, certainly you know him. And Gene said, don't shorten it, lengthen it, write a book. And 15 years later, um, I came out with this, which is an attempt to rethink a, a recent Chinese history, as I said, and to use history uh, to understand uh, China's current uh, developmental role. Now, I want to talk about the structure of the book uh, and some of the points uh, that it tries to make. Um, in the introduction to the book, I try to make a case that ecological history is a different way and a more enlightening way, or at least an additionally enlightening way, I should say, to look at the last 70 some years of China. Now, I use a lot of concepts here that come from 
a resilience ecology or systems ecology. And I won't go through them all today, but there are three key ones that I'd like to spend just a little time explaining. The first one is what the distinguished physical anthropologist, evolutionary anthropologist, James Wood, retired from Penn State, uh, calls the Malthus and Basra Bratchett. And his basic point here is that in, in pre-industrial societies at least, and I think it actually also works for industrial societies, um, as Thomas Malthus uh, Enlighten, uh, enlighten us over two centuries ago, um, uh, you can expand the population faster than you can expand land uh, or the product of the land. And so when population uh, increases, as it does when people are in a condition of prosperity, which he called plenty, um, then eventually the population outstrips the ability of the land to provide for it, and people move into the condition which he called misery. That is to say, you get starvation, famine, uh, disasters, uh, and so forth. But this is only with a particular technology which has its limits. And so the way to react to that, uh, rather than think of Malthus as a complete prophet of doom, the Danish uh, developmental economist Esther Bozerup in the 1960s uh, proposed that what happens when people get themselves into this condition of misery is they invent a new technology or they invest more capital or they invest more labor. And thus they temporarily overcome uh, the limits of that previous system of production. And so they reproduce more. Or I would say in my modification of it, they don't necessarily reproduce more, but they produce more. Uh, and at the end, the newly uh, restructured with better technology system uh, also runs out of its ability to expand uh, and people go back into misery again. And if you think, if you look at the last several centuries of Chinese history, Particularly if you look at the Qing Dynasty, uh, you see uh, the Qing Dynasty could uh, represent curve A in this drawing. Uh, and we certainly had misery uh, for the last 100 or 120 years of the Qing Dynasty. And then um, in the People's Republic, uh, there was an in, in infusion of new production techniques, new labor organization, uh, new technologies, uh, and we get into curve B. And the question is, uh, will we get into misery and will we have to some kind of a, as yet not clearly envisionable curve C. Now, second concept that I wanted to talk about is the re relationship between productivity and resilience in an ecosystem. Uh, and that's to say a human managed ecosystem such as just about all of China is right now. If resilience is the ability of an ecosystem to withstand disturbance or shock and keep functioning, um, the early stages of development or agricultural intensification uh, can bring productivity and resilience into a direct relationship with one another. In other words, you um, increase the productivity of the system. Let's say you build terraces on, on a formerly on a hillside that was formerly uh, farmed on a steep slope. Well, they're going to produce more. They're also going to prevent er erosion uh, and the productivity and the resilience will uh, go together. But if you increase the productivity too much, if you get rid of the, the sort of the leeway in the system, then resilience will go down and you become dependent on uh, specific aspects of the system that are difficult to keep up. And the final concept that I want to talk about is the fix to fix to fix, uh, which is this. Uh, when a authorities or a regime or capitalist, doesn't matter, when someone builds a um, an intervention in the environment, such as a dam, uh, it's going to cause, it, it may have its environmental benefits, such as uh, flood control uh, or the ability to irrigate uh, more, more land, something like that. But you eventually, uh, it's also going to cause uh, environmental problems. And in order to alleviate the environmental problems that were caused in the first place by building the infrastructure, 
rather than taking out the infrastructure, you build another infrastructure to um, to supplant it to fix the problems that were caused by the initial fix. An example uh, in, in the book is the uh, example of Poyon Lake, where the uh, Three Gorges Dam uh, caused hydrological changes in the Poyong Lake. But of course, you're not going to take out the Three Gorges Jam. What you're, Dam, what you're going to do is build a sluice gate across the uh, Poyong Lake, and thus the dependency on infrastructure continues. So that's the first part of the book. The second part of the book is simply to tour China's social ecological systems. And I take this uh, division from uh, the great uh, geographer Joseph Whitney. Um, but the, the darkest part is China proper, uh, the traditional agrarian civilization. Uh, the uh, very light part in the Southwest is, uh, I borrowed this term, Zomia from James Scott, uh, an area of mainly Sweden cultivation coupled with hunting and foraging and um, uh, without a centralized state and a much lower population density. And then Chinese Central Asia, which is mostly pastoral systems. And the, the temporal structure of the book is based on this scheme that I showed earlier on. Uh, there's also, and I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking mostly about this, an internationalist way to periodize Chinese history. That is to say, China's huge development, especially, but not exclusively, but especially in the last 40 years, uh, has not been confined in its environmental effects to China, but has affected the whole rest of the world. So I think we can um, take uh, Chinese environmental history and look at it in terms of its effect on the, the rest of the world. And in the 1950s, uh, was really very, mostly autarky, but with a, a considerable dependence on the Soviet Union, particularly for imports of oil and other fuels and, and machinery. Uh, then with the Sino-Soviet split, uh, the uh, autarky got even more extreme. Um, but then in the, uh, after the beginning of the so-called reforms, um, the China started importing other people's environmental degradation. Uh, it was uh, producing furniture by cutting its own forests. It was producing uh, pollution by manufacturing goods for the rest of the world. But as China got even richer, um, after greatly after the turn of the millennium, uh, it started exporting degradation, such as imp importing lots of illegal wood from from um, uh, from Siberia or for um, a fishing in distant waters and fishing out the fisheries of other places. So I do this uh, periodization. And then in the, I tell the story of China's uh, ecological history twice. First, I tell it in terms of land, water, and food. And I'm going to hear um, the main point is that China's ecosystems have developed a, a rigidity trap um, with, to use a term from resilience ecology, or if you're an economist, you would say a path, uh, path dependency, or if you're an economic historian, you might say technological lock-in. That is to say, China has uh, increased its productivity uh, even more than it's increased the population, uh, but this means that it's um, in, in, that it's food producing systems and its, uh, and its uh, natural resource systems are very fragile, not very resilient. And we can think of this uh, if we look at two stages of, of feeding its population. The first stage uh, starting of course in, in 1950 was simply trying to provide enough calories. And in doing so, China was pretty much our, 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 um, autarkic. It didn't import much food. It didn't export much food. It was really, uh, or other agricultural commodities. Uh, it really was was self self provisioning. I won't necessarily say self sufficient because the provisionings provisions weren't really sufficient. But but since the late twentieth century, uh, the China has been providing not just enough calories, uh, but what's considered a good diet, a much more varied food, and this has led to. Um, the uh, change, uh, the change in the diet. If, if you look at this from the uh, mid 2010s, um, China has moved from 
uh, about seven grams of uh, animal protein per person per day in 1982 to about uh, almost 40 grams uh, in the mid uh, 2000s. And this, of course, has had its effect. Um, if you look at the the um, graph in the lower left, China produces way more grain than it needs to provide enough calories, but it doesn't produce enough, uh, in fact, uh, to provide the varied diet which the population continues to demand. And so uh, after, um, to, after 2000, um, China is uh, exporting uh, environmental degradation in order to provide this diet. And the way this works is of course you have to feed the pigs and the other animals that provide uh, animal protein a diet variety so you have to grow a lot more corn uh, people eat almost zero corn directly now uh, which was certainly not the case particularly in north and and southwest china uh, but they grow it for feed and so a, a great amount of the increase in in production of grain is feed corn but uh, if the pigs don't just need corn, they also need a source of uh, protein in their diet. And China can't grow enough soybeans, so it imports soybeans. And it imports them mostly from the United States and uh, Argentina and Brazil uh, to extent from Canada, to extent from, uh, from Bolivia. And in many places of South America, this has resulted in export of China's um, export from China of the uh, environmental degradation in, in parts of South America. Another example is a fish. Uh, in the late 1990s, the regime encouraged, through using uh, subsidies and other incentives, expansion of the nearshore fisheries. And this quickly, within a decade or so, depleted the nearshore stocks and contributed in many ways to the degradation of coastal um, and nearshore habitats. So um, the reaction to this, once again, is not to um, decrease the amount of fish available to the population, but to expand, uh, ex expand uh, distant fisheries and promote uh, unsustainable uh, practices, such as these uh, fish processing plants uh, on the coast of West Africa. Uh, another uh, example of this is water and degradation. Uh, that is to say, uh, China has dammed uh, many of the rivers. One of the interesting things about China's geography, of course, is no rivers flow into China from other countries. Uh, all rivers flow out of China in every direction. And the, the Lansang River, which is uh, Mekong in, in, in Southeast Asia, uh, has um, there uh, uh, nine major Chinese dams on the Mekong River. Uh, mainly uh, in order to provide non-fossil fuel electricity through hydro generation. And this has completely disrupted the uh, fisheries downstream, particularly the Tonle Sap Lake in um, Cambodia, another example of export of environmental degradation. Then I tell the story again uh, at the end of the book in terms of cities and industry. Um, and if you just look at this um, curve, here's the Here's the paradox and here's the main lesson. Huge gains in efficiency and productivity uh, and the bottom graph shows the uh, in energy intensity of China's economy. Um, these have not been sufficient to offset the environmental and climate effects of huge growth. I said huger here, that's a typo, but a huge growth, uh, which means that the total energy consumed uh, and thus the fossil fuel energy consumed uh, has risen. So. Uh, once again, and telling the story this way, mainly autarky 1950 to 1980, particularly after the large discoveries of oil in Heilongjiang and Xinjiang uh, in the late 1950s. And then import of environmental degradation in the uh, 90, starting in the 1980s. And we can exemplify this by plastic. Uh, China produced 28% of the world's plastic in 2016. Um, and of course, the processes uh, involve uh, environmental pollution uh, on, the, on behalf of other countries and imported 70% of the exported plastic waste. And steel is another one, simply that China uh, produces 52% of the world's steel and, um, uh, and exports uh, about 12% um, you know, of that, uh, which is almost as much as the United States produces. Well, so that's a a um, 
a, a general overview, and I just want to conclude with a few insights. One, of course, is that when we talk about ecosystem resilience, we only know it afterwards. We only know whether a system can absorb a shock uh, when the shock has come uh, and it's absorbed it or not. A second uh, lesson is that China's transformation from developmental state to eco-developmental state has followed the same tra trajectory as other countries in, in East Asia, just a little bit later because its level of development has lagged behind those of um, South Korea and Japan and Taiwan. A third one is that China is both a leading greenhouse gas emitter and a leading builder of green solutions to environmental and climate problems. So we can have politically motivated discussions here in North America about uh, whether China is a, is a leader in the world's greening or whether it's the leader in the world's uh, you know uh, headlong rush into climate disaster. And of course, uh, the answer is both. Um, finally, there is no generalizable difference between the environmental records or capabilities of democratic and authoritarian uh, developmental regimes. Uh, this is a political and ideological dispute, uh, but it seems to have no clear answer uh, when we actually look at the environmental and the ecological facts. And um, once again, China has gone from non-participant to importer and is now becoming an exporter of environmental degradation. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for, uh, for that fascinating um, uh, presentation that highlights the essence of your book. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions coming um, uh, later from our audience members to uh, learn more about the book and hopefully they will also have a chance to purchase the book and, and read, read it in whole. So now I would first like to invite um, um, Ashley uh, to provide your comments. Go ahead, Ashley. Myself. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Steve, for that wonderful presentation. And also thank you to Christine and Genevieve and everybody else who helped organize this event. Um, I want to establish my positionality a little bit uh, before I comment on, on Steve. Uh, Steve and I have uh, collaborated for a few years now on a couple of book projects uh, as co-editors, along with Mary Alice Haddad and Joanna uh, Lewis at Georgetown. Uh, these projects have looked at uh, environmentalism in East Asia and um, uh, the clean energy transition in East Asia. So Steve is a collaborator, and my comments may be biased in a favorable way uh, as a result of this um, collaboration. But for an even longer period of time, we've been hiking buddies. Uh, we've probably spent, I don't know how many hours, walking at least 100 miles of trails in the Cascades, the Rockies, and uh, the hills uh, south of Carmel in California. So uh, over the course of these, these hikes and conversations and events that we've held, uh, I've I've gotten to hear lots of things about um, his work, but one thing that's really interesting is that he didn't really talk about this book uh, on these hikes. Uh, it, it was something that he 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 was he was thinking about or, or keeping to himself, uh, focusing on in other circles over the course of the fifteen odd years he worked on it. So when I got to read the book, I really learned a lot. And it was an exciting experience for me. Um, so I'm just going to share a few of my reflections uh, on what I think this book is uh, and why I think it is uh, so important. So first, uh, in my view, this is a, a novel perspective on ecological, geological, political, and social change in China, uh, mostly since the founding of the People's Republic, uh, though some chapters look even further back in history. He mentioned uh, the Qing period. Um, he has some good analysis of what was going on there. His focus, of course, is on uh, the People's Republic. And I think the book does a really good job in explaining the challenges, achievements, and pitfalls of socialist and mostly capitalist agriculture and industry in China. So just think of the breadth of this endeavor. It's tremendous. Uh, the book also uh, looks at the revival of capitalist farming practices and the reform uh, period, 
Um, uh, and it neatly provides uh, theory and evidence to explain how the incentives produce more stressed China's environment to the breaking point. And then uh, in his final sections, final, final couple of chapters, he shows how environmental devastation um, led to um, an eco-developmental term uh, turn in China. And this occurred after terrible floods in 1998, uh, prompted reflection uh, that contributed to a broad shift by state and society to think about the health of the environment locally and to some extent globally while pursuing development. This is what you might call eco-developmentalism. And here I'm gonna make one tiny aside to connect the University of Alberta to this project. Uh, the term eco-developmentalism was developed by one of my students uh, in my introduction to Chinese politics class. I was workshopping some, some uh, titles for our, our book, Greening East Asia, The Rise of the Eco-Developmental State. And I wanted to get some, uh, some student feedback uh, on a couple of titles. Steve had already produced this idea uh, of what you know, eco-developmentalism is, but it was a student in the back uh, of the class, Riley Coulter Krauss, who said, you know, I think the best term for that is eco-developmentalism. So actually the term eco-developmentalism, which I have no doubt will be popularized by virtue of this book, uh, came out of an undergraduate classroom uh, at the University of Alberta. So uh, Steve's book does incredible things, uh, including thinking about uh, trade-offs associated with uh, China's energy choices, still mostly coal, uh, but increasingly uh, renewables, an area where China is a known uh, leader. Um, these are kind of broad areas that I think the book uh, makes important contributions to. Um, what amazes me in reading this is that this sweeping arc of the narrative uh, touches on so many things, the life of flora, fauna, and humans in China, um, where Steve writes about uh, the resilience of Mongol herders during Mao's famously chaotic totalitarian rule, the economic choices of apple farmers in remote mountainous parts of southwestern China, and disasters faced by shrimp farmers in Guangdong province due to monoculture and excessively intense production that led to disease among the shrimp and to die-offs. Uh, so the book is, uh, to reiterate a point I've made, uh, more than just an environmental history. Uh, it's an account uh, of, of social and political change in China. Uh, and it's one that's refreshingly free of the ideological blinders that have become rather common in media takes on China today. And this is largely because his focus is on the environment. Uh, and this is sort of the window um, for looking at uh, change uh, in China uh, in numerous ways. The book, I think, also does a nice job in critiquing some prevailing notions that the Mao period was anti-science and anti-development. Uh, uh, this book makes a convincing argument that the Green Revolution uh, involving um, chemical fer fertilizers and hybrid plant uh, breeds that led to increases in agricultural production of staples, uh, principally uh, in the Mao period, rolled out in ways that are pretty similar to how it rolled out uh, globally. Um, that's just an example um, of uh, how technology was being ad adopted um, by Mao's surprisingly developmentalist regime. I say surprisingly because Mao's regime was also known for the Great Leap Forward. Uh, an economic and political and social and environmental debacle, uh, as well as for the prolonged disruptions of the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976. Um, this book um, does cool things in places where you don't expect it. Um, uh, Steve develops uh, ideas that could find their way uh, forward in the political science article, like when he talks about environmental governance in terms of three C's, uh, the problems of coordination, corruption, and cadre evaluation. Uh, this is a, a great way of characterizing difficulties that the Chinese government faces, not just in environmental governance, but in many aspects uh, of, of its governance. Uh, and he sort of drops it in uh, to a chapter um, but it could, you know, be important in other um, areas of scholarship related to to China 
as well. One thing I really love about this book uh, is that it places China uh, and the Chinese experience uh, in a comparative context. And this is something that generations of China scholars have struggled to do because the People's Republic is so large and it's so culturally distinctive. Uh, and it remains, of course, one of the world's few Communist Party-led um, governments. Uh, but as he argues, I think controversially, the PRC has done many of the things that democratic states uh, in East Asia, like Taiwan or South Korea or Japan, have done to ameliorate uh, the effects of, of pollution. Um, another cool thing about the book is that it's not your usual account of the, the Chinese heartland, focusing on areas populated by the Chinese majority. Um, Steve leverages much of his earlier work as an ethnographer and expert of Chinese ethnic uh, minorities, subtly, but I think mightily in this book, to bring readers to isolated, poor, marginalized, and sometimes troubled parts of the country, uh, including Tibet, Xinjiang, Yunnan, and southwestern Sichuan. Um, and at the same time, Steve is also writing about uh, the heartland and mining and urbanization and uh, manufacturing issues of great interest to uh, many in the country. Uh, this book, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say, is audacious. It's audacious in terms of uh, the breadth and depth of what it undertakes. It has so many diagrams, tables, maps, figures. Steve, how did you ever get the publisher to allow you to print so many? Uh, it was It's really an impressive uh, labor of love. Uh, another thing that, that I want our viewers to know about and hopefully future readers of this book is that much of this book was completed after Steve's retirement uh, from the University of Washington. Um, and this is a work of history, but history, as Ja pointed out earlier, is not really Steve's area of expertise. He was trained as a cultural anthropologist and, and he has had what I would uh, like to say is a healthy obsession with forestry and, and agriculture. So yeah, this is almost a great work of intellectual trespassing, um, but my sense is that many historians, uh, if they haven't already expressed their affection for this work are, are certain to do so. Uh, I think this is a book um, that's going to be talked about uh, for a really long period of time. Um, I I suspect that Steve, as a perfectionist, would prefer to have some criticisms of this book. Um, I, I don't have too many criticisms. Uh, sure, I might quibble with differences in terms of whether or not uh, shark fin soup actually tastes good or not, whether or not you can tell if a shark fin soup is really a shark fin soup or not, or or perhaps his with his characterization of the of the Chinese media's uh, independence for reporting on environmental issues. But really what I want to do is uh, raise a few um, points and questions um, that uh, I'll invite him to uh, speak about uh, in um, the, the the portion of this event that will follow um, the commentator's remarks. So one question is about the structure of the book. It's curious to me. The book, uh, as Steve noted, is written in two parts. He sort of tells the story uh, of China's uh, ecological history twice. Why twice? And not once. I was curious about uh, the making of the book in that way, because by telling it twice, um, the history is kind of covered twice, uh, albeit with respect to different issues. There's a history of um, agriculture that goes over the same time period as as the, the chapter on steel. So what, what went into the decision uh, to do that twice? I was curious. A second question uh, refers to that first theoretical framework that he mentioned at the outset of his talk. And this is the uh, the Maltus uh, Basarip uh, ratchet. Um, and and I'm, I'm curious about whether or not he can envision or is willing to speculate about a curve C going forward. Uh, because if we look at Chinese society today, we see that population is declining. Uh, and probably technological innovation is happening faster than ever. So if you were to speculate about the future, what do you see a curve C looking like? Um, I find myself to be 
uh, somewhat more optimistic perhaps than you are. Um, on page 427, you note that economic inequalities are not going away and this contributes, quote, as more as much or more to some kinds of consumption and particularly to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that's a quote from the book. However, um, people are choosing uh, uh, electric forms of transportation to higher degrees than ever before. Um, uh, green choices, at least in transport through e-vehicles, uh, are becoming both uh, cost, cost effective and convenient. Uh, I'd love to hear any thoughts about what you see as possible for that curve C. And then a third point, I've got other questions, but I'll, I'll leave things here, uh, concerns uh, the micro mechanisms of the um, environmental Kuznets curve um, that you talk about in your, your final, um, uh, final chapters. Um, this is an argument that um, that allows you to say, oh, authoritarian countries and democratic countries aren't really all that different in how they uh, tackle environmental issues. Um, you see uh, economic development measured perhaps at a per capita level leading to responses to uh, air pollution um, that are, and other types of pollution that are perhaps analogous across uh, other polities. Um, I love this argument, and of course, you published a more in-depth version in Greening East Asia, but I wonder if you'd care to talk more about the micro-mechanisms. How does this happen? What's going on in these polities, whether it's China, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, or other polities, that leads them to say, at the governmental level or the societal level, that they need to do something uh, about environmental problems. I feel like this is a, a great argument that sort of establishes a correlation, but the causation um, could be painted in uh, a bit more. Uh, and perhaps a last question, um, and, and maybe our, our audience would be interested in this, and this pertains to environmental justice. Uh, you talk about environmental justice uh, concerns are remaining rampant in China. This is not, of course, uh, a Chinese issue alone. All countries have environmental justice concerns, including Canada and Alberta. Uh, but how do you think students of China should be researching this uh, and thinking about uh, environmental justice issues in China? Uh, what are some of the topics that they might look at uh, as they develop projects to um, gain leverage on this uh, really important issue? I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ashley, for that very comprehensive overview of, of the book and, and also for the um, great questions. Uh, uh, two of the questions you mentioned, actually, I was uh, wondering about. So um, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, Stephen, would you mind or would you be interested in me maybe just responding to uh, some of Ashley's questions um, um, at, the, at this point of time? And we can also save some for later, if you like. Yeah, I could I could say quickly. Um, why did I tell the story twice? Um, I was going to tell it three times, and uh, the publisher said, "No, no, 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 this is already too long." Um, but uh, why did I not just tell it once? Was because it's too hard to get everything together, and I just felt that I couldn't um, come up with a logic of narrative uh, that would allow me to integrate everything. Uh, very easily. And so it would be clearer and uh, simpler if I were to, um, to, to take these two kinds of trends uh, separately. Uh, could have been two books. In fact, that was under discussion with the publisher. Um, but we, we decided that, that we'd stick with the one. Um, curve C. I think there may be uh, an end to this ratcheting process. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, population began declining on uh, April 19th last year or something like that. I don't know how they figured out that that one person dying, you know, put it over the edge, but anyway. Um, that, um, uh, and uh, it's, uh, uh, James Wood, when he put forth the idea in the late 90s, he simply said it was pre-industrial. I thought it could also imply to industrial systems um, if as long as they were growing. But if there is really something uh, like degrowth, 
which I think would be spurred more by demographic degrowth than by per capita income degrowth, uh, then the model may have run out of its usefulness, which is fine. Um, the micro mechanisms of the uh, uh, in, uh, turn toward eco developmentalism, uh, I think, and briefly, it's about a legitimacy crisis or the fear of a legitimacy crisis on the part of the of, of the government. Um, you know, the the popular reaction in an authoritarian system is a, is a little bit different. You can't you know vote the rascals out, um, but you can publish. Uh, documentaries like uh, Chongqing Jixia uh, underneath the dome uh, and you can uh, protest uh, environmentally uh, and you can worry the policymakers. Uh, at the same time, the policymakers have been aware of the, of the concrete uh, possibilities of con continued environmental degradation uh, so they would no longer be able to produce a sort of a, a, a slow motion second great leap forward scenario and you put these two together and uh, the same policymakers are are, are going to make changes um, and um, as far as consumers, it's the same thing. Uh, but of course, as you pointed out, uh, the it, consumer choices have to be um, uh, backed up uh, by uh, economic rationale. Um, how should uh, students of uh, China be researching environmental justice? I think this is the perfect lead in to Loretta's presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for. Um, for covering so much ground here. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, Loretta for your comments. Go ahead. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes, good. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank Ashley for inviting me to discuss this uh, terrific book. And I would also like to thank the China Institute at the University of Alberta for organizing this virtual book event. Um, it, is, it is really a privilege to have the opportunity to comment on this really timely and thought-provoking book and to exchange ideas with Steve and also with fellow panelists about Chinese history and its ecological future. So um, because of the, um, I'm compelled to declare my positionality after what Ashley has just done. Um, so I was uh, an undergraduate student of Steve uh, many, nearly 20 years ago now, I think 17, 18. Um, so not many people have the opportunity to comment their, uh, their teacher's book. So uh, I'm not sure if, I don't know if my comments will be biased or not, but uh, uh, I took up this challenge and I hope I'll do this book justice. So, um, An Ecological History of China is a book that has brought appeal to scholars in China studies, particularly historians of China and environmental historians. And it will also be interest to readers concerned about sustainability more generally, as we can't really overlook China's impact on global ecology, given the nation's size and also the severity of its environmental problems. Though not apparent in this title, an ecological history of China is also an indispensable work for social scientists grappling with the multi-scalar challenges we face in the Anthropocene. So in my commentary today, I am going to share a few thoughts as an anthropologist, highlighting the relevance of this book to my disciplines and its intersections with some of the new and also long-standing debates within anthropology. So at the heart of this book is a question that all of us, wherever we are, have pondered in one way or another. Is environmental degradation an inevitable result of economic development? Is the damage reversible if we are committed to reversing it? No doubt these questions have been central concerns for scientists and social scientists over the past two decades. In year 2000, atmospheric chemist Paul Christen reintroduced the term Anthropocene, which was first coined by ecologist Eugene Stormer in the mid 1970s to refer to a new e geological epoch. This 
epoch is characterized by profound by the profound impact humans have had on the Earth's ecosystem, now identifiable in the geological record. Key aspects of the Anthropocene, as documented by Steve in part two and part three of his book, include significant alterations and pollution of land, water, and atmosphere, primarily due to industrialization, agricultural intensification, urbanization, and urbanizations during the PLC's developmentalist stage. So since the reintroductions of the term, the concept of Anthropocene has sparked extensive debate among scientists and social scientists. While the scientists are debating the new epoch except beginning, anthropologists critique the concept for implying a homogeneous human impact on environmental degradations. They contend that historically, industrialized and developed nations have had a larger ecological footprint. And as such, many of them prefer alternative concepts such as capital sins or plantational sins, which highlight capitalism or colonialism as the primary drivers of environmental change rather than humanity as a whole. With the rise of multi-species ethnography, some anthropologists also criticize the concept for being overly anthropocentric potentially downplaying the complex interactions between human and non-human entities within an ecological system. Now, in light of this, I wonder if Steve consciously avoided the term Anthropocene in this book, given its strong anthropocentric connotation. This term might not fully encapsulate what he said as the interactions of humans, society, and the rest of nature, what he refers to as a social ecological system or ecological history. Steve said, understanding China through its ecological history involves viewing China and its constituent parts as systems of interconnected elements that have interacted over the course of time. By interconnected elements, he refers to not only people, animals, governments and its laws and policies, the usual suspect in discussions about China's environment, but also land, water, air, trees, crops, bacteria, chemicals, values, film, art, even literature. So while neither the title nor the content of this book makes explicit reference to anthropology, Steve's approach to history through social ecological system situates his work squarely within anthropology and cognitive disciplines, given their increasing interest in planetary thinking and more than human approach. This makes the book highly relevant, not only to historians and Chinese studies scholars, but also to anthropologists, geographers, sociologists, and scholars in science and technology studies who are concerned about the varied assemblages within an ecology or network, to borrow Latour's term. But despite this book's interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary appeal, delivering its message in a way that resonates across all of these diverse fields remain challenging. Citing Walker and Elbold, Steve made clear that the social ecological system are neither humans embedded in an ecological system, nor ecosystem embedded in human systems. Rather, they include flows of energies and materials, but also flows of ideas, power, and social relations. These perspectives very much aligned with the call for planetary thinking in many social science disciplines. However, many scholars in these fields remain resistant to describing the interaction of these flows and the encounter of human and non-human entities as a system. In fact, I would go as far to say that many of them are a bit allergic to the term system, likely due to the functionalist connotation that it carries. So with this in mind, I wonder if Steve could elaborate a little bit more on the notion of system within a social ecological system. How does it differ from systems in other contexts? What might be missing if we don't incorporate a social and ecological system into our, our analysis? As I understand, a social ecological system is not merely a complex set of interconnected elements 
functioning cohesively or linearly through the cause and effect, but rather it encompasses dynamics such as growth, shrinkage, shifts, flips, and feedback loops at the nexus of humans and other parts of nature. I think your explanations on uh, this, on, on the idea of system, would allow more non-ecologists to appreciate this framework more. A systemic and ecological approach to history also complicates some of the firmly established views about development, capitalism, and socialism. In anthropology, there is no lack of critique of development. So from Arturo Escobar to James Ferguson, anthropologists have long critiqued that the poverty and deprivation we see much of in much of Asia, Africa, and Latin America were the consequences of structural violence. And according to Steve, this critique maintains that these countries were not developing under the benevolent hand of the rich countries. They were actually underdeveloped because of the oppressive colonial and then neo-colonial exploitation by the rich countries. Now, not surprisingly, this is also a view held by Chinese communists and many leftist thinkers. They reject that uh, capitalist ideology of development as a linear progression where developed nations, wealthy nations lead the way for developing poor nations. And this perspective sees poverty as a temporary and remedialed, remediable through capitalist investment, mostly through aid, um, following the development trajectory of developed countries. But despite their ideological difference, what's really interesting is that Steve argues that their material goals were more or less the same. So they both want a life where people do not have to struggle to survive. Ideally, they enjoy a comfortable life when plenty of material with plenty of material goods. They live in an uh, efficient society in which machines do most of the hard work. And more importantly, neither the capitalists nor the communists they took the environment or ecology very seriously until it was a bit too late. And both of them were, um, were and are hyper-anthropocentric, paying little attention to the ecosystem. Chinese communists, prior to the phase of uh, eco-developmentalism, had maintained that pollution was a capitalist problem. And according to Steve, the primus was that capitalism caused environmental pollution because it was driven by profit and unbridled greed. This is a reasonable argument, but it became highly problematic when the communists and the eco-Marxists extend the logic to its inverse, claiming that since economic actors in a socialist system were not driven by profit, they were not driven by, they, but, they, but instead they were driven by the good of people, socialist economic growth, unlike the capitalist counterpart, would not lead to environmental degradations. Now, this is really fascinating because the excerpts that I have just read out is not only indicative of Chinese communist thinking at the beginning of the 20th century. It is also emblematic of much of contemporary leftist thinking that takes not a lot of consideration of ecology, how ecology works. Capital sins and alternative concepts that emphasize specific economic systems as the primary drivers of environmental change speaks volumes about this view. From my perspective, what we need is perhaps to move beyond ideological debates and critically reflect on the kind of social and ecological futures we want for ourselves and for our next generations. Do we need growth? How much? When is enough? Is the growth feasible? How do we measure green growth? Would traditional cultural buffers such as frugality that Steve identified have a role to play? In his conclusion, Steve appears to have stood by green growth rather than degrowth. He acknowledged China's transitions from a development-first approach to eco-developmentalism around the turn of the century, but cautions us the jury is still out on the possibility of green growth. Why, I am curious, why green growth and not degrowth? You said degrowth is um, some radical peoples uh, take up this idea. I would love to hear more about this. So last, um, some final remarks. 
I think among the many lessons that we can learn from Steve's insightful study of China's ecological history, the most important one, I think, is that we need to be careful not to let our personal and political preference influence our interpretations in historical and sociological research. In a time when identity politics and politics of difference take center stage, this is easier said than done. And it's true that we are in the same storm, but not necessarily in the same boat. The impact of climate change and environmental degradation is not uniformly felt, and this point back to the questions of environmental justice. Yet, as Steve eliminates, on the whole, the grand historical process of development, environmental degradation, and partial remediation seems to proceed about the same no matter the form of governance. So as I said earlier in the commentary, there are many limitations to the concept of the Anthropocene. Still, it is a concept that raises awareness about the profound impact that we, Homo sapiens, have on Earth's ecosystem. It is only by seeing beyond our different interests, I think, that we can build true solidarity. And it is this short solidarity that will give us the determinations to face the various challenges of the Anthropocene. Um, so that's the commentary from me. Um, I have more interest. I have. I'm very interested in the food security and the agricultural chapters, but can't quite fit in those um, more finer, quest specific questions into the the comments. So I guess we'll leave it for the podcast. Thank you, Loretta, for the um, very insightful comments and. Uh, um, Stephen, I, I wonder if you would like to perhaps respond to uh, some of the questions uh, Loretta raised in her comments. Sure. Uh, thank you, Loretta, for an incredibly insightful uh, series of questions, um, which um, illuminate my slight alienation or maybe great alienation from anthropology as a, as a category that I want to be put in. But uh, that really raised some really interesting things. I'll go quickly through them because I really want to hear what Philippe has to say too. Um, did I consciously avoid the term Anthropocene? I can't say that I did. I, I've thought about it some, um, but um, I think it's partly because I was trying to integrate um, systems concepts with uh, linear concepts uh, um, uh, and uh, in, in other words, a kind of linear view of history, but a, a systems concept of how it worked. And I also didn't want to get into that particular debate because uh, of all these other scenes, you know, and, and you could spend a lot of time saying, well, this is a plantation of scene or is it a capital of scene? And it takes it totally away from the connotation of geological epoch, uh, which is what I think the most um provocative connotation of, of, of that term. So it, it just kind of didn't fit. <laughs> That's maybe what I have to say. Um, the challenge of integrating all of this and aligning with um, with planetary thinking, I think I've been unconsciously um, or maybe consciously influenced by the, uh, the thinking of uh, Noah Sui'i people that uh, Ashley mentioned as a, a place where I have uh, spent a lot of uh, time and effort and friendship, um, uh, where um, they have both at, at the same time an idea that humans are are no different from other actors in, a, in an ecological system. Um, you know, humans are one of 12 descendants of the snow and they include such things as bugs and trees and also bears and, and monkeys and snakes. Um, and so humans are not special, but at the same time, humans are special. And I have a lot of proverbs that talk about the parallels between the social world and the natural world, each of them uh, seen in this kind of um, systems uh, systems context, um, and I I, I think um, you know using the systems as a concept, you, you have to get out of uh, this sort of um, how should I say this? I think all the debates in anthropology that I'm aware of, and I won't claim to be up to date on them. But all the debates in anthropology about these various scenes and 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 so forth, um, 
take as their conceptual basis things that come out of the intellectual tradition that has often been called Western. I, I don't like the word Western because it's a politicized uh, uh, you know, term on both sides. Um, it's either bad for Xi Jinping or it's good for the, you know, the traditional American conservatives. But um, that you have to get out of that and start thinking about concepts that come out of different traditions, not as objects of analysis, but as frameworks for analysis. And I think that anthropology has uh, mostly failed in terms of getting out of its so-called Western-centric uh, frames, even while it critiques uh, the West as the main villain in the linear process of, of world history. Um, in terms of the capitalism and socialism, um, uh, I, I will simply say that both sides are hypocritical. Um, about their own uh, about their own relationship to the environment and they're talking less about their own and others relationship to the environment than they are in making uh, political points in a, in a geopolitical game um and um did I choose green growth over degrowth yeah maybe because it seems to me that degrowth is politically impalatable to anyone except, if it is propelled by demographic degrowth. In other words, if we had the same amount of per person environmental impact and the same amount of social and economic and environmental injustice um, that we have now, but we had the 2 billion people that were on this earth when I emerged, um, then uh, we would have a one quarter of the problem. Uh, that we have, uh, you know, now with 8 billion people. And so degrowth in the economic output and thus in the environmental degradation is probably politically palatable only if we have a declining population, which of course, as Ashley mentioned, is something that's happening in China and will happen everywhere at the micro level um, because uh, people simply don't, individual people, individual women, individual couples don't, don't want as many children for various reasons that I certainly don't have time to go into. So thank you I, I, I for both of you. Uh, your comments deserve uh, longer replies, but we, we uh, do want to move this thing ahead. So thanks again. Well, thank you, Stephen. And now I'd like to turn to Philippe for your comments. Okay, well, thank you very much, John. And uh, I guess the, the the benefit of going third is that uh, I can be informed by all the insights that have been shared uh, by the by the first panelists. But at the same time, the challenge means that a lot of things have already been said. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I, I would like to share a few thoughts. You know? The first thing I'd like to do, though, is uh, is express uh, to you, Steve, uh, my congratulations. Uh, I think this book is is uh, is is uh, is impressive. Uh, it's topical. It's interesting. It's got an impressive uh, breadth and a depth to it. Um, and I guess uh, I find it personally compelling because I actually have traveled uh, extensively through uh, many of the places that uh, that you refer to and talk about. So I think we have some overlapping uh, experiences there, uh, which I'd love to share, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, I've done some hiking uh, and driving. I, I drove over 300,000 kilometers on my personal Jeep over the last 15 <laughs> years through Sichuan, Yunnan, Guizhou, North and Northwest China. And so I'd love to share some stories, but it also kind of brings some... Um, uh, it, it makes the uh, it makes some of the examples you use personally compelling. You know, I also spent a lot of time with the E and uh, in the Yangshan, which uh, I agree is a very fascinating part of uh, part of China. Um, I I actually just moved back to Canada uh, in uh, this summer after having spent uh, 22 of the last 25 years uh, living in China, uh, including the last few years in um, in Guangzhou, where you can kind of see firsthand some of the uh, the real kind of cutting edge of uh, of both uh, the, the the continued scope and intensity of Chinese infrastructure development, but also the cutting edge of its kind of green technology uh, development and how it's kind of seizing the mantle uh, globally for some of the what what could arguably be some of the more sustainable technologies that are that are being presented uh, as practical for the world. I mean, honestly, uh, just as an anecdote, it's it's hard for us to fathom in the West even now, how uh, how well developed the 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 world of electric electric vehicles, for example, is in in South China, uh, you, to the point where uh, 
uh, I'd say in 2023, if you're living in Guangzhou or Shenzhen, which is like also close to the manufacturing base for those uh, for those new technologies, you actually notice internal combustion engines. You don't notice uh, electric vehicles. I mean, it's it's probably 75 to 80 percent of vehicles on the road now are 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 uh, are, are EV. Uh, and of course, now moving back to Edmonton. For the first couple of days, I was noticing the internal combustion engine vehicles, but now I, I, I'm re I've reverted to the norm of uh, <laughs> of noticing the EVs, which are definitely not at the eighty percent, or indeed at the twenty percent <laughs> level uh, here in Alberta. So, um, so it, it uh, I've had a chance to kind of see some of the trends, and um, uh, you know, maybe to get back to your book, I'd I'd I'd, I'd also like to note from the outset that I really like um, uh, the fact that you know when you read this book. Well, the focus is about the relationship uh, between China and its ecology and the history related there too. Uh, to me, it's also, you, you, for many readers, I think you'd be using ecology as a lens or a means for, for learning about China writ large. Uh, so I, I, you know, I can't help but think that this book would be a great contribution to kind of like, a, you know, the, the, the type of textbooks that we would recommend as introduction, introduction to China books, because, um, uh, you know, I, you were mentioning, Steve, that uh, your, your objective is to use history to understand uh, China's ecological role. But I would argue that uh, the, your book is also a great way uh, to better understand China's history, uh, but uh, through an ecological lens and especially modern Chinese history. A lot of the issues and trends and historical milestones that would normally be approached from a more kind of linear historical perspective or from a political science uh, perspective actually get incorporated into your into your book but from an ecological kind of storytelling uh, lens and and actually i think it's a great way of pulling a lot of what uh modern china is all about together uh in a manner that would be very complementary uh, to some other textbooks so i would actually not only recommend it uh, like loretta to you know uh, historians anthropologists and people interested in ecology i would actually recommend it to uh, undergraduates who are starting to show interest in learning about china writ large um, you know, uh, it's very useful uh, for all of us uh, when we kind of think about contemporary China uh, to understand the broad sweeps of uh, China's journey, uh, you know, the traditional concept of harmony uh, between man and nature that was woven in into the Chinese historical fabric and culture over millennia, uh, with perhaps the first um, uh, anthropocentric uh, iterations uh, kind of starting to to, 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 to to emerge around the time of Confucius and this kind of like a new ethical and kind of moral uh, approach that kind of puts uh, humans or man at that time and 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 his relationship uh, socially as, a, as as of equal importance uh, with respect to his or her relationship with the environment. Uh, I mean more recently of course uh, while the the the, the regimes pay lip service to that historical legacy, clearly in kind of Marxist, Leninist, Maoist uh, times, uh, it's much more of an approach focused on man over nature and man overcoming uh, nature in order to uh, achieve development. Uh, the That kind of, um, you know, the Yigong, uh, Yigong Yishan mindset uh, perjures to this day. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, we still think of the great historical words of the past to give those examples of China's mastery over nature, whether it's, uh, you know, the Dujiangyan waterworks uh, in Chengdu from uh, 300, 400 BC or the Grand Canals. Uh, but actually, uh, you know, those of us who, who have traveled in China recently, we know that uh, there are great infrastructure uh, projects today that are absolutely mind bending, not only in terms of scope, but in terms of the speed uh, with which they can be uh, effectuated. So um, one one that really still sticks in my mind and that I would love to kind of go see again uh, at the next opportunity is the, uh, and, and Stephen, maybe you'll be uh, sympathetic to this. One. I don't know if you've had a chance to go there since then, but the, the you know, it's about a five, six year old highway now that runs from Chengdu to Kunming through Xichang. So it's basically going through, you know, uh, foothills of the Himalayas in Western Sichuan, all the way down through some very uh, steep mountain ranges that separate Sichuan and Yunnan and down into Kunming. And the reason I mentioned that uh, road is not only because the scenery is spectacular, but it's around 600 kilometers long and it's 80% bridge and tunnel, right? So it's, 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 it's mind boggling to think that you can kind of uh, uh, create this type, these types of, uh, these types of projects today. So, 
Um, you know, that, that's just kind of trying to set the stage. But uh, if if I may now, uh, as 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 I read your book, uh, there's there's some there's some uh, questions and perhaps uh, uh, forward looking musings uh, that came to my mind, and I certainly would welcome your thoughts, Steve, or or anyone else's either now or in the future. Right. So. So the first the first one that comes to mind is uh, from a kind of contemporary perspective is uh, the tension between the continued kind of growth imperatives that the regime faces, uh, and that's very salient today as we as we know the Chinese economy is 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 in a, in a fairly slow kind of growth phase right now, relatively speaking. But the tension between that growth imperative and the and the desire to promote you know for for you know shorthand here I'll say green GDP right. And you know, you kind of as you travel on China, you see the lingering effects of of, of large scale development, whether it's in terms of water quality, stress on the land, uh, you know, re reduction of agrarian land available because of the growth of cities, et cetera. And there's been this focus on green now as 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 equally important uh, green GDP development as equally important to with respect compared to economic development. But but uh, and you know, there's been some rhetoric from that perspective and 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 as you note in your book some government structures have also shifted over the last decade or two whether it's you know upgrading uh the environmental agency into a ministry and giving it more and more remit and uh, and influence right but um, um so the rhetoric pays heed to this but i'm still wondering whether the actions kind of follow suit right is china walking the talk in terms of uh trying to uh, reconcile economic development and environmental development, uh, and and whether at the end of the day, uh, I'll get back to this in a moment. But you know, at the end of the day, uh, are they generally focusing on ecological impact, basically out of necessity versus out of uh, conviction? And and the reason I put it that way is you know uh, clearly uh, there are legitimacy issues for the for the CCP, whether it's in terms of being able to ensure uh, a suitable ecology and environmental uh, uh, situation for the population, but there's also the urgency for economic development. And I kind of wonder whether they rank equally, uh, or or whether one remains subsidiary to the other. And 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 from that perspective, I guess we kind of get into that kind of um, very interesting way that you frame it, where you talk about uh, productivity and resilience, right? And so, are we always going to kind of try to stay just on the edge? Of, of of ensuring resilience of the ecology while we keep ginning up the economic growth, right? Uh, so so I think that's an important question to ask because the kind of like the black swan events that would actually topple resilience if if we're kind of at the edge of uh, always pushing it to the edge are, are occurring more frequently and with more severity than than ever before. So uh, I'd, I'd be I'd be interested to know kind of how you you you. You, you think about that or how you would unpack that um a couple i mean i have a lot of thoughts but i'll try to be fairly brief and just throw a few out there because uh i know we're, we're running a, a bit long i also wonder if you have any uh, thoughts with respect to uh, environmental diplomacy and and how china is uh trying to position itself as a as a custodian of uh of environmental norms globally um you know from a canadian perspective we we actually one of the few areas where We've actually cooperated quite uh, fruitfully with China in the short term. In the re in recent history, is uh, when we co-hosted the uh, COP uh, that uh, on biodiversity that uh, that was originally planned for Kunming, but the second part had to be held in Montreal uh, in extremis uh, because uh, the Secretariat is in Montreal and COVID zero was preventing uh, China from hosting. And actually, uh, we actually tried our best to. Um, uh, to, to to deliver some 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 useful outcomes uh, from that conference uh but but while it was clear that china is eager you know and i guess uh, this is, sounds like ancient history now but in like kind of the pro post obama early trump years was e was eager to kind of seize the, the the mantle of leadership globally on these questions when you take a closer look at the type of norms that they're trying to put forward uh i think it's reasonable to ask whether uh that attempt at, 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 at uh, seizing the mantle of global leadership is really in the service of trying to enhance uh, global norms or or rather uh, in the service of trying to redefine them in a way that's more consistent with uh, the narrative that China's spinning in terms of, uh, you know, uh, global development and uh, responsible global citizenry. So that would be a question uh, that kind of maybe ancillary to your book, but kind of nevertheless related. Um, 
Uh, I also wonder whether it might be interesting for some academics or thinkers to to take advantage of the corpus of your work uh, and try to ex extrapolate what that would entail from a kind of a Chinese uh, foreign policy perspective. Uh, you know, uh, the, it, is is uh, you know water scarcity, uh, uh, food uh, dependency, uh, and the challenges related to energy. Uh, can they be drivers of uh, domestic political uncertainty, or can they actually also at some point also have a fundamental influence on the orientation of Chinese foreign policy? Um, I think, um, uh, you know, regionally as well, I think uh, that's even more salient if you look at uh, China's behavior, current and projected, and 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 the impact on the Mekong sub-basin, for example, you're talking about, you know, water management and uh, and, and also deforestation in, uh, in in areas such as Myanmar. So that that's that's what another area. Another area I think that that is kind of worth thinking about, and I'm kind of jump to the the end of my thinking here and bring it to the beginning because you a couple of you have already mentioned it, but that's this kind of dynamic where I, I find it interesting to to reflect on your conclusion that you know democratic uh, regimes and authoritarian regimes basically at the end of the day uh, have a similar record on on uh, environmental and ecological matters. Uh, I, I I I I think that's that may be true factually, but I wonder whether whether there's not some qualitative differences there that we could try to reflect on. And for example, you know, I think you've probably been exposed to this as well, Stephen, but, uh, you know, the, the role of NGOs in China in terms of driving the ecological agenda uh, was very significant over the course of uh, several decades. Uh, but I can, uh, as many of us know, that the, the space for those types of actors in 2023 China is very, very narrow. Uh, and so uh, one could wonder whether uh, this is going to lead to uh, less enlightened approaches because of the lack of pressure and the lack of kind of agenda driving from inside China and in, in, uh, looking forward. Um, you know, Yunnan is a great example, you know, from the early days of uh, protesting uh, regarding the, uh, the, you know, the environmental disaster of uh, Diancha Lake uh, next to Kunming, uh, to a protest with respect to potential dam building, uh, to, uh, you know, series of efforts, uh, you know, re responding to deforestation, reforestation, some very compelling documentaries that were witnessing, you know, the ethnographic impacts of large scale uh, developments, etc. So that, from what I can tell anyway, in today's China, those types of kind of like fomenting kind of agenda driving vectors are are basically no longer there, right? And so, uh, that's 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 one point regarding the, the, the democratic regimes versus authoritarian. The other one would be, I think, with respect to transparency and uh, and how projects get underway in the first place. Uh, I think uh, probably some of you are familiar with the debates related to large hydropower infrastructure projects, right? And how uh, late in the in the Hu regime and early in the Xi regime, uh, both uh, Premier Wen and then Premier Li kind of tried to put a moratorium on hydropower development and that was partly as as an attempt an extreme an extremist attempt to check like the, the 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 temptation on the part of local governments to use those kinds of massive infrastructure projects to basically uh, in a corrupt manner kind of uh, satisfy some of their uh, local constituents and and so uh, if there's less transparency going forward in terms of how big projects are determined how much should we pay, how much confidence should we have, how much trust do we have in the ability of the regime to kind of placate some of those kind of internal drivers of of, uh, of the past when it comes to uh, wondering uh, whether large-scale projects should go forward or not. Um, okay, uh, I, I, you know, again, uh, I, you know, I could elaborate on many of these, but I'll just throw a couple more out there and I'm happy to kind of elaborate on my thinking later if you want. Uh, I think a fun kind of blue sky uh, offshoot of what you're working on is also wondering about the ethical dimensions of um, current postures related to China's uh, economy, its trade in relationships and the environment. Uh, I see kind of a, a, I guess for lack of a better term, a kind of a reverse mercantilism going on, uh, both uh, China outbound and China inbound. Uh, China, you know, the, the West in a way, I know you don't like that term, but uh, for shorthand at this point, you know, has kind of been exporting some of its pollution to China by buying, you know, uh, consumer industrial goods that are polluting to, to manufacture 
uh, but uh, but enjoying the benefit of those products without uh, but whilst China has been kind of uh, suffering the burden. So it gives a diff certainly a different spin on 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 trade deficits. Uh, but conversely, as well as uh, China has kind of like increasingly looked to the global commons and also uh, weaker, more vulnerable regimes. I'm sorry, I've had a very quiet office uh, for the last three months, but there's somebody telling me. Why don't I pause this? Okay. Um, all right. Thank you, uh, Philippe, for the very thoughtful commentary. And uh, Stephen, I wonder if you would like to um, perhaps respond to uh, some of uh, uh, Philippe's comments. Okay. Stephen, would you? Yeah. Okay. I can stop there. Uh, it's yeah, it just true that the drilling occurred so that, uh, so that yeah. uh, we can advance in the sake of time. But I'm happy to share more thoughts later. Yeah. Can, can you talk for another minute? I, I might have something emergency here. Uh, I'll be back in one minute or, or not. Okay. All right. Uh, so... Uh, so I was just kind of uh, mentioning about uh, the, the kind of international trade dimensions uh, uh, going both ways and the environmental and ecological implications of, of the way things are structured now on the international trade side. So I think that's something that's worth uh, thinking about. I was also going to mention on the Curve C uh, conversation that uh, uh, our other discussions were having with Steve a little bit earlier, to my mind... Um, I, I'm not sure about the mathematics there. Uh, my sense is that uh, even though we're clearly going into a, a demographic kind of like stagnation or decline mode, uh, the, the carbon footprint of, of uh, more prosperous uh, Chinese citizens is, to my mind anyway, uh, is going to far outweigh any benefits. Uh, if you look at the mathematics of of, of citizens who uh, who are consuming more protein, uh, more animal protein, who are uh, spending more energy, I think it vastly outstrips, even from a pure mathematical perspective, the uh, the, the small percentages in population decline. And um, and uh, maybe uh, I'll, I'll uh, finish with uh, with uh, just simply saying that uh, I have several other thoughts, but I, I, I think we're, we're kind of running over time anyway. Uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, close in, in saying that I look forward to continuing this conversation and, uh, and hopefully in the future, uh, Ashley, Loretta, and perhaps some of us uh, watching today, you as well, Ja, maybe we'll have a chance to go for, for a good hike with Stephen, uh, either uh, in, the, uh, in the foothills of the Himalayas or, or, or perhaps more easily uh, on the Pacific uh, West Coast uh, somewhere uh, and, uh, and continue sharing some stories. So thanks for the opportunity to comment. What a, what a great thought, really, there. I would love to one day to join uh, perhaps Steve and other colleagues on a hike. And the last um, uh, nature hike in the mountains I just had was a few weeks ago in China in the Shaoxi Mountains, and it was, um, um, it was a beautiful one. Um, okay, so uh, Stephen, would you like to address some of uh, Philip's comments here? Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, sorry for the interruption, it was false alarm. Um, the, um, uh, I'll just re reply to uh, one of uh, Philip's observations and then to his comments, or to his questions. Um, yeah, I've taken that highway many times, uh, probably eight or 10 times uh, round trip. Uh, from uh, Chengdu to Xichang. And, um, but I think that the most important thing is that it's probably fairly deserted now uh, because uh, when it came under, um, when, when it was put through, which was uh, around 2011, I think, um, it was, you know, 2012, um, it had reduced a 10 hour train trip to a four hour car trip. Uh, or a five and a half hour bus trip, but now they built a high speed railroad through there and it gets from Chengdu to Xichang in three hours and 10 minutes. And so has basically superseded the highway uh, since the last time that I was there. And this is just indicative of the process of some of these uh, infrastructure uh, uh, infrastructure projects. Um, 
With regard to the tensions between economic growth and the so-called uh, uh, green GDP and the changes in you know rhetoric versus actions, um, I, I think it all does come down to legitimacy on the one hand in terms of central policy. And you mentioned uh, Pre Premier Wen Jiabao as a, a not really opposition to hydropower development, but uh, opposition to particular uh, hydropower development on the New Jiang uh, in uh, in Western Yunnan, uh, which flows into uh, Myanmar. Um, but um, there's the legitimacy considerations from the standpoint of the central government, but again, there's a development co um, considerations on the part of, of, of local governments, and they're inevitably, uh, in, in fact, going to clash. Um, but um, I want to just bring up, I had a previous uh, event at University of Washington, and uh, David Bachman, whom you know, um, a political scientist, uh, he kind of poo-pooed the idea of uh, green development altogether, and he cited all sorts of statistics to show that uh, China's uh, greenhouse gases were increasing and uh, and uh, all sorts of other environmental degradation and investment was more in coal than it was in, in uh, electricity and so forth and so on and so on. Um, and that eco-development was completely hypocritical and that I was sort of making a, a you know, taken in by the uh, dishonest rhetoric of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, whose actions have not followed its words. Um, but I think this is really a part of a, um, of a larger uh, paradox. As long as there is economic growth, uh, then you have to do the mathematics, uh, like you said, of the you know the the, the ratio of the uh, per, of um, energy intensity uh, versus total energy consumption. And so far, it's continued to go up because ec uh, economic growth has been so fast. If economic growth does slow down, then energy intensity may or energy efficiency may outpace uh, economic growth. Uh, we may begin to see the the promised um, um, uh, peaking in in emissions and perhaps uh, peaking in other kinds of environmental uh, harm uh, by 2030 as the, as the government has, uh, has promised. Um, are we at the edge of resilience uh, you know, of a lot of these systems? Well, I was come back to my original uh, insight, I hope it's an insight, that resilience is knowable only in retrospect. Uh, you know, you can guess whether a system is resilient, but you don't know whether it's resilient unless the, uh, like you say, the black swan event uh, happens. So uh, maybe. <laughs> um, as far as the environmental diplomacy, particularly the, the Montreal uh, biodiversity, um, I think that China is more behind in, in from strictly environmental uh, perspective that China is more behind the curve diplomatically than it is um, domestically. Uh, and, and this simply has to do with geopolitical uh, rivalry for military and investment uh, 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 opportunities, uh, rivalry with the, with the United States. Um, should uh, this extrapolate to uh, diplomats, I would simply refer you, I will send you, Philippe and others, uh, the link to a, a book event that I did at the Brazilian Institute for International Relations, uh, who contacted me and wanted to do a panel on this book. And uh, one of the panelists was a diplomat that you may know, um, uh, Marco Tulio Cabral, who was the environmental attache at the Brazilian embassy in Beijing for a long time and also um, uh, Isabella Teixeira, who was the Minister of Environment in the, uh, in the, um, uh, in the Dilma government, uh, which preceded uh, the uh, Bolsonaro government. Um, and uh, they really address these questions in a very interesting way that's uh, sort of new to me. And uh, I would recommend uh, that recording is online. I would recommend, uh, recommend listening to it. Um, NGOs, of course, uh, I had my own experience. I ran a small NGO in China for a while and uh, we, we got out while the getting was good. But it, it certainly um, will 
will pressure on the government diminish? Yes, probably in the short run. But again, this is another guess that I that I can, can't really justify. Um, so I think I'll I'll stop right there. Uh, we're already at the uh, over the projected time for the event, and I don't, don't know, Ja, how you want to proceed, but I, I'm here, so. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, and and um, um, and I think we'll just uh, extend by just a few minutes and just cover uh, a bit of questions from the uh, audience members, and then we'll um, we'll wrap it up. Um, so, uh, okay. So, an audience member asked uh, whether you have engaged, Stephen, you have engaged in research uh, uh, in the Chinese uh, China's economic. Uh, ecological field uh, currently, or you're, you are engaged currently, or in a more you know recent capacity? No, not anymore, um, because I haven't gone to China, and, and I probably won't be going to China, but I did a lot of actual ecological research uh, together with ecologists out in the field, measuring trees and measuring stream flows and, and taking uh, soil samples and so forth. So I think this has gave me, uh, you know, gave me a perspective that a lot of uh, social science people don't have. Right. And uh, well, here's a really tough question. Is there any plans to translate this excellent book into Chinese? Well, not yet. You know, uh, at the Brazilian event, there was a, a, a fellow named uh, uh, Yu Hongyan from uh, Shanghai Institute of um, Environment of uh, Foreign Affairs, who's an ecology expert, uh, or at least an environmental expert. I wouldn't call him an ecology expert, political scientist. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of it would have to be softened, I think, in today's atmosphere if it were to be uh, translated in uh, PRC. Now, whether someone in out, outside uh, of the uh, governance sphere of the Communist Party would like to translate it and then smuggle it into China, uh, I would uh, love to see that. Uh, All right, thank you. Um, um, and also, of course, um, we, we have many academic colleagues here, and uh, Ashley mentioned there are a lot of great data charts, graphs in your book. Um, so there's a question about um, what kind of information and data you find the most difficult to to collect for your your project or to access for this book. You know, it was enabled by the internet. I I, I used it on the uh, uh, I, I did it on the internet. Uh, a lot of it during the during the the uh, height of. Uh, of COVID restrictions. Uh, I don't live near a, a, a major library. And uh, so the hardest things to, to, to gain access would be local archival records, uh, which I basically have not done. And this is one of the reasons why I was afraid uh, of historians reading this book, because history is written from archives. But uh, so far, I'm very thankful um, and relieved that a lot of historians have uh, have praised the book, um, even though I have not employed the methods of a, of a um, of a true historian, or anthropologist, or, or ecologist, um, uh, or um, or or um, an environmental politics person. It's it's been a true kind of uh, 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 kind of effort. Well, thank you, Stephen. Um, perhaps just one last question um, from me, if I may take advantage of my role as the moderator here. Um, and it, it is an amazing book and a, a massive volume of um, uh, helpful information and analysis. Um, I'm just wondering in this day and age where many of us uh, are in this almost like a collective anxiety over climate change, uh, environmental degradation, and wondering what to do, and uh, and this book, of course, talk about the China uh, China's experience. So, um, if another country uh, who's currently in the sort of still on onto development phase, and and look at this book and and wondering what will be the maybe the me main lessons, and hopefully there's there's some hopeful that message there that they can learn uh, from China's experience uh, that you have examined. Well, you know, this is in the in the context of uh, of North America, you know, and I live uh, about uh, uh, forty kilometers from Canada, and um, I you know, admire Canada's record on just about everything except the environment. Uh, <laughs> I was to say that frankly, um, 
and uh, and especially in comparison to the United States, which has uh, been worse on just about everything uh, except the environment. Um, but um, I I think one thing is the universality of the problem. That is, I won't say the universe, but the globalness uh, of the problem. That in, in a sense, China's more important because it's bigger um, uh, than, you know, Lithuania or or or, or Senegal or, or, or even Portugal. Um, and, um, but the problems that it faces are, are, are really the same. And the slant of all political economies with a possible exception of North Korea and very partial exception of Cuba, um, but including China and, and, and all the rest of the world, um, it, it makes it hard uh, that political systems as they exist make it very difficult to care for the earth. And uh, people are trying honestly and other people uh, pay very little attention to it. Um, and I think this is as true elsewhere as it is in China. And so you, you don't want to have a message of despair you know, it's different uh, enumerations of the seven deadly sins, or have different uh, different ones, but sometimes they include despair, and um, one tries to avoid that, and one tries to avoid uh, the sort of catastrophism, uh, especially as uh, applied to China uh, by geo interested geopolitical parties, particularly the United States, um, and perhaps the EU uh, as well. Uh, to try to uh, point fingers and and say, oh, oh gotcha, you know, China's uh, China's the problem. Um, China isn't the problem. Um, growth uh, and inequality are are in fact the problem. And the real question is: Is green growth possible, or what sort of degrowth might be possible? And because China's so big, it illustrates, I think, in starker terms. Uh, than any other country other than the United States and India and perhaps Brazil, um, the um, you know the both the enormity and the immediacy of the problem, but one doesn't simply want to talk about the problem. One wants to talk about solutions, and I hope that this will open up the way to thinking about solutions. And the other main thing is something that I said in, in response to Loretta's comments, which is that uh, academics have to, or not have to, like, you know, should <laughs> um, move beyond the theoretical or conceptual frameworks that come out of the tradition of Western philosophy uh, and look at frameworks that come from indigenous or, or or other civilizations and look at those seriously in light of the way that, um, in other words, um, quit trying to be imperialist in your anti-imperialism. Uh, so I, I think that's the academic lesson and the practical lesson is uh, it's just, look, this is important. Uh, you know, let's pay attention to it. Well, absolutely. Um, on that note, um, thank you so much. Uh, this was a truly um, illuminating discussion of a fascinating book. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much, Stephen, for authoring this important but also very timely book, highlighting the experience and lessons um, of modern China's uh, ecological journey to date. Uh, and also sharing the essence of the book with us today. Uh, of course, for our audience members, and uh, you can always purchase this valuable book um, through the link uh, that we posted. Yes, posted on, um, uh, in the chat. There's a 30% discount code, so it's a really good deal. And also thank, thank you, our discussants, for your very insightful comments. And uh, I would also like to thank our colleagues at the China Institute for working hard behind the scenes yeah. uh, to make this event happen. 
Uh, we will uh, make the recording available with the permission of our speakers. We will will post a recording. I know a few uh, audience members asked that, so we're hoping to, to do so soon if our uh, speakers agree. Um, and also Stephen and Loretta are featured in a upcoming podcast um, hosted by Syntech Asia. Please visit their website. Uh, also will be posted in the chat for more information. Then finally, a big thanks to all the audience members for your participation and for your time. Uh, and please stay tuned for uh, other events coming up at the China Institute. Again, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye -bye. I want to say just thank you again. And and um, this is the eighth event that I've done. And so far, they haven't repeated themselves. It's been, it's been really interesting that uh, every group of intelligent interlocutors, including this one, has come up with new ways for me to think about this, even though I've been thinking about it, as I said, for uh, 15 years. So uh, I want to thank you especially for that. Thank you, Stephen, uh, for that uh, um, last comment. Indeed, I mean, there's a lot of diversity actually in thinking and you already alluded to that and uh, with uh, many brilliant minds here but also different cultures and different civilizations um, have have their framing of uh, the relationship between humans and and uh, nature and um, I think we can learn a lot from that uh, let's uh, keep an open mind thank you again everyone thank you